And welcome, welcome everyone. And this week we have an absolutely legendary episode with the one and only Steve Baxter. Steve has had huge success throughout his career and he's become well known through Shark Tank. And before that, he successfully exited two startups with his latest selling to the TPG group for 373 million. It was such an honor to have Steve on the podcast and I couldn't be more thankful for this opportunity. Steve offers some terrific insights on the episode, and we also dive deep into his hobbies, the problems with the current Australian government initiatives, and so, so much more. I couldn't be more excited to bring you this episode, and I'm sure everyone will absolutely love it. From his advice to entrepreneurs, to his success in his current business, Transition Level Investments, this will truly be an insightful listen. Now, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Lessons from Success underscore podcast and on Facebook at Lessons from Success as well. We'd also love a rate, review and subscribe on iTunes as it definitely helps grow the show immensely. Now sit back, relax and enjoy this incredible episode. Well, today we have the legend, Steve Baxter, on the show. Everyone knows him from Shark Tank, but we're here to talk a little bit about everything about Steve and and what his life's been like as an entrepreneur. So thank you so much for coming on, Steve. The legend, is that right? The le- oh, legend to me. Oh, so. Fair enough, that's pretty sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much for coming on. No worries, Bryn. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's have a little bit of a chat about you. So apart from Shark Tank, what do you find yourself doing most days for the people that don't know too much about you? Oh, well, I mean, uh, so this is 2019, just to give some perspective for people here. Uh, Shark Tank got cancelled late last year. So we had four seasons of Shark Tank Australia. Um, very enjoyable four years. I'm somewhat surprised we got season two, so I was pretty happy with four seasons, to be honest. Well, it's just when you look at the ratings and what happened, it's been a curious time in free air TV evolution, the last sort of five to ten years. It definitely has. And, yeah. um, you know, ratings have fell off a cliff everywhere, and, and Shark Tank was, it bucked a trend to a point. It, didn't, it wasn't as bad as some, uh, some shows at the time, but, you know, they, they kept it around for four years. Uh, very much enjoyed doing this show. Um, uh, you know, we got to see a. Uh, we got. To, I think we got to, to put a lot of content out there that was net positive, helpful to the Australian community. We actually got Definitely. some good deals out of it. We got we got a couple of amazing deals out of it. Oh, that's great. So, um, you know, overall quite helpful. But outside of Shark Tank, what do I do outside of Shark Tank? Um, so, you know, we're in here today, and my office is here in Fortitude Valley. Um, I run this is my my family offices, which is a bunch of professionals here who who assist us making investments um, for our family. Um, We've got uh, somewhere between 29 and 51 investments, depending how you count them. We, we invest in some funds that have companies inside them. So okay. it depends. You know, they're not quite direct investments. Yeah. Um, probably about most of those in Australia, maybe about six or eight in the US, I want to say, maybe five or six in the US. Hmm. Um, add sort of about five names that list, five to eight names that list every year. Yeah. Um, we're off to a flying start this year. We need to <laughs> slow down. Um, so... Day to day for me is uh, I have a crew that run out of here. I'm trying to do less. Um, I'd like to be with my family more. I'd like to play. With, uh, I'd like to. I'm a mag keen aviator, so I'd like to be doing that more personally. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so with uh, with the aviation sort of stuff, what plane are you flying at the moment? Uh, I've got a an aircraft called Twin Commander. It's a 1973 AC90, all uh, was known as a 690 Alpha Twin Commander. So it's a high wing twin turbine. So it's a small version of a Qantas Link aircraft. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so it's nice and speedy. It can go into. Uh, it's really my it's my remote fishing machine in some respects. It gets me to places I can go fishing a little a little better and a little faster with some friends. So. Um, Australia, I like to fly in the US, which is, you know, they've got lots of runways. Thanks to the Cold War, they've got lots of long bitumen runways. Got to have something good come out of the Cold War, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's right. So uh, but in Australia, we don't have a great deal of runways, and they're not particularly long, and they're not particularly bitumen, so, you know, it's yeah. it's, it's tough. You've got, to, you've got to, get, you know, you've got to have a reason. If you want to get to these places, you can't get there with a the jet. Yeah. Well, you can, you'll land it, you'll never take it off again. <laughs> so the point. insurance company's going to own it after you land it. It's pretty rough. <laughs> So, um, so that's good, you know, about three quarters the speed of a jet, and, um, wow. yeah. Um, For a machine that old, too, that's amazing. Oh, the engine doesn't matter so much. I mean, it's just, yeah. it, well, it doesn't, it doesn't. So, um, and the engine technology hasn't changed in the last, in general aviation hasn't changed in the last sort of 30 years. Yeah. Um, they're, 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 they're pretty much high science, to be honest, that sort of stuff, so they're, they're pretty the same. It's been probably rebuilt about three or four times in its life. It's quite low airframe time. For it's, uh, it's got, only got, only got 10,000 hours on it. Wow. Which is, you know, nothing for 30 years. No, not so, at all. Yeah. I'm sure you'd wish you got the hours up a little bit more over the time. Yeah, no, yeah, you always want to use your toys more. But, um, so I enjoy flying. Um, I used that quite extensively last year. Um, I did a year as uh, Queensland Chief Entrepreneur and 
we did a lot of missions out of out of Brisbane here, out to regional Queensland, as far north as uh, Cairns, and out to uh, Cloncurry, uh, Longreach, down to um, uh, St George in the southwest, uh, Emerald in central Queensland, and you know every port in between. To be honest, and we mm. took people from Brisbane, out of uh, out of Brisbane, and into these into these you know fantastic regional towns. Um, what I find in business is that everyone likes to network and, and get together and have a chat and talk to peers and they're in their just people in business, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yes. But when you're in, you know, when you're in uh, Richmond or in Cloncurry out out northwest, yeah, you get the same butchers, baker, candlestick maker at every networking event. Nothing. I, don't, I, I like butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. No, you've got to mix it up, though. Yeah, not having a go at that. Yeah. So I'm just. It's about, it was about bringing fresh, fresh perspective. Yeah. into places that don't, that don't probably don't see it that often. Yeah. So did, yeah. Did you bring a lot of tech guys out there as well? Because I, I wouldn't yeah, imagine to see too much we, tech. We, we, got, we got all sorts. Um, yeah. I didn't. You know, the reason I took my plane is we sometimes do six or seven destinations in two days, and you can't. You know, oh. and the really good people are busy, and so they, mm. if they, in fact they give you two days, it's actually quite generous. Absolutely. So if you're going to take three or four, maybe five as standard transport, it's, it's going to be tough. Yeah. So uh, that was a really quite efficient way to do it. So we took all manner of people out. Um, investors, people running businesses, people running, you know, hardware accelerators. Oh, I've got to be thinking now. People <laughs> building sort of regional internet service providers. Uh, uh, you know, investors, you know, the chap who used to run Virgin Startups, Richard Branch, we took him out. Uh, it was a fantastic trip. Uh, we took some angel investors out of uh, the southern states up to, to talk to people as well. So, you know, we've, we did a, uh, yeah, we did, we, did a lot, we did a lot. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think back now. I'm trying to remember who went. I think we did about ten missions. So That's in about twelve months, yeah. Yeah, and and the 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 thrill of the mission was getting everyone out there and getting everyone speaking to people they wouldn't usually have access to. Is yeah, that... I think um, everyone you know people we took out were quite happy. Um, you know, I think I think that they saw the benefit. For me, it's you don't. So I you know as carrying around the, the sort of business card of Queensland Chief Entrepreneur, which is about all it was. To be honest, there was nothing else really attached to it. Hmm. You shouldn't say there was an officer of good people, but you know there was no. It was, it was what you made of it. Um, yeah. So uh, for me, it was like, okay, so how do we actually get how do we get more expertise and experience out of out of the, the capital city into these regional areas? And how do we take we need to actually take that back and actually talk to politicians here about what's going on. So um, and so to me, it was about trying to engage in a conversation at a really sort of meaningful grassroots level, mm. and trying to sort of say, hey, you know, people out there, that this is what they're doing, and this is what they haven't got, and you might have a, a perspective from One William Street from your beautiful glass castle. Yeah. But um, this is actually what's going this on. This is actually what's going on. Yeah, did yeah. Right. And especially with the world of the internet now, and everyone, you know, you can essentially teach yourself any skill you'd like. People out in the in the in the sticks, I should say, quote unquote, are, are learning all these amazing things. Hey. Yeah, out in the sticks they are, mate. <laughs> out in the sticks. So uh, otherwise known as the rest of Australia. Mm. Um. Yeah, look, you can, um, but you know, it, 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 I, I don't think in that respect people where they live are, are any different. You know, if you're that lazy, you won't learn in the city. If that lazy, you won't learn in the bush. That's true. So there's plenty of people who are lazy. Yeah. So uh, the information's there. It's never been more accessible ever. It's exactly. never been cheaper to do things ever. So um, there's lots of reasons and lo- lots of reasons to do things and lots of reasons why it's a lot easier than it used to be. Yeah. In the role as uh, chief entrepreneur for Queensland, uh, what have we approached for the role, and, and what did they? Did you have an objective while you were in there, or is it just kind of a, a two day thing that you did? And... No. So, um, so the we worked with the, the previous um, uh, Campbell Newman government on on a support package for the startup sector in in uh, in Queensland, and the whole thing working through for the Campbell Newman government. They were they were quite good mm. um, through to through the current governments. It's just burnt me working with governments and public servants, to be honest. It is because it's just it, it's so hard to get anything done. It's so inefficient, yeah. and they all think they're working incredibly busy. They they might be busy, but they're not they're, they're not productive. Um, so it's been really tough. Uh, so the part of that working through that we we were identified. I started River City Labs about six or seven years ago. And, and out of that process there, what we were finding is there was a lot of people with good intent in the community yeah. and we'd, we'd, um, we'd, we'd run events, we'd over, accidentally would over-program each other. So we'd have events on the same weekend or the same night or we'd, you know, we wouldn't talk and, and be as efficient as we could because we were busy and, and maybe a little bit competitive in that sort of weird way. Yeah. And so one of the suggestions we had for them was like have, a, have a, a liaison office so you can actually, um, uh, uh, you know, coordinate things better. And, and um, the suggestion was that we call it the Office of Chief Entrepreneur, and the, and the, and the initial 
and they said, well, well, who will be the chief entrepreneur? And I sort of said, well, no one, because you, you can't get someone to work with government. But I call it the weekend at Bernie's role. You, you're, probably <laughs> way, you're probably way too young. Have you seen Weekend at Bernie's? I haven't. All right, you're way too young. There's, there's a great movie, look it up, probably, oh, gosh, late 80s, early 90s, Weekend at Bernie's, where these guys get invited to their boss's place, Bernie, mm. for this all-weekend party, and Bernie dies. <laughs> Right, and but they want to keep the party going, yeah. so they stuff Bernie in the cupboard basically and bring him out every now and again to wave to friends and everything else. So he's, <laughs> the, he's a dead guy, like it's, it's a lot, lot deeper story. That it's, it's about drug dealing, all sorts of stuff. It's quite a funny movie, yeah. Um, but they call it the weekend to Bernie's role. So you know, wheel out the dead entrepreneur in the cupboard, or the, the old <laughs> stiff, crusty entrepreneur, and they can wave his hand and put him back in and forget about him, or mm. him or her, yeah, whatever, <laughs> gender, blah blah. So, um <laughs> So uh, and so, it's literally a figurehead role. Was was that was envisioned, and, and then um, uh, Mark Salby took the first role, and mm-hmm. he, he very much redefined that role. I, I was asked to do the first. I was actually asked to be the first chief entrepreneur. Then I found I was having twin girls, and I said no. Yeah. So <laughs> Mark, keep Mark, busy Mark, enough. Yeah, very much so. So Mark stood in and uh, did a great job. Really, really changed changed the role really quite aggressively in a, in a positive way. Mm. What did he change? So, in a, in a, I well, guess, he he, he tried to. Well, literally, I thought it was a weekend of Bernie's role. Yeah. Um, and he said, no, we need to do this better. We need to have our office staffed. We need to do a, a really big push and to get government engaged and get the community engaged. And, and no drug take, dealing, of course. And no drug dealing. Yeah. No, yeah, that was never. That was just a movie. So. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, so Mark, Mark, you know, w- jumped in with both feet and did that. And if you know Mark Sauber, he's he's an absolute he's an absolute tornado of energy, and he was he was fantastic for it. So yeah, that's amazing. Um, and then so when I came in, they sort of, they asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, well, you know, they, they, they said, what, what does it entail? I said, whatever you want. Hmm. Um, it literally is a title, yeah. and they'll they best to back you. Um, so I said I wanted to. They asked me to they asked me to give them three things, and I said I wanted to do four, and it was. Um, Try and um, get expertise out of out of the, the capital city into 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 parts of Queensland, not the capital city. And mm-hmm. I hesitate to use the word regional because it's it's talking when you say regional, you talk down to people. That's true. Yeah. So um, it's basically about it's about spreading the the intellectual capital we have here with respect to experience in, in Brisbane and taking it out places outside of Brisbane. Yeah. Um, in that process, that was number one in that process, understanding understanding capital in general. So the the perception is that there's a lack of investment capital in Australia and Queensland. I don't know if that's true, but we, we did a lot of work talking to high net worth individuals and people and stakeholders in the regions about how to get investment. So we did that. We did the angels, sort of, did, did, did a lot of formation of angel group stuff up and down the coast. We did uh, we worked with wholesale investors. So we actually bought a bridging a bridging capital sort of uh, abatement scheme to available to startups in Queensland, and we worked on a couple other things at the venture end, which never which never eventuated. Hmm. Um, I wanted to try and help fix telecommunications because M- MBN has, has, has led us into a path of disaster. So um, it's been working with Queensland government to free up substantial state-owned fiber optic resources in order to build a, uh, uh, a high-speed wholesale backhaul network through regional Queensland, and that's gotten some progress. Um, unfortunately, the public service is slowing it down because I think they're smart, um, and they're not. And then my uh, my fourth one was uh, flying cars, and so I advocated. And it was like a big heritage goal. I said, get around to talk about flying cars. I spent an hour and ten minutes this morning coming twenty two kilometres for Christ's sakes. Yeah. And we're going to build more roads to fix that. The roads are actually the problem, not the solution. Yeah. So um, people aren't people aren't just thinking clever about that at all. So. Especially with the the estimated growth that Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne are all supposed to have by I think it's twenty twenty five. They they predicted to be absolutely astronomical. Mm. I mean flying cars would really solve everything. It, it, it would go a long way. It, it, it's interesting you look at, and I, I look at it from a purely selfish point of view, and I, I want to get to, I don't want to spend so long in the car. And I'm lucky, I sit in the back of a limousine, everyone's going to shake their heads and call me some rich prick or whatever it might be, I don't really care. Hmm. But I sit there because it's actually more efficient in my time to sit there. I yeah. can get some work done, if you know what I mean, as opposed to driving through traffic. So, um, so it doesn't really affect me, to be honest. It's frustrating as hell, that hmm. I've, you know, for such a short distance it takes. You know, it's 29 via road, 22 in a straight line. To, to come that, that, that distance. So, um, but when you start applying your mind to it, and you think, well, okay, so, and you look around and there's people doing this, there's, there's that, that many flying car concepts that are flying, mm. um, not quite reliably yet, not quite with enough payload, but that'll, you know, in two to five years, that'll change, it'll double every two to five years. Yeah. So, um, there's one concept out of Europe called the Lilium, L I L I U M, and it does 300 Ks an hour with two passengers. Wow. Um, so you, so you turn the conversation around. You sort of say, well, okay, so forget congestion. So, so if if and ha- 
Where do you live, mate? How far away from the city do you live? I'm in Bowen Hill, so Oh, you're pretty close to you. Yeah. Right? How, how far would you live away, do you reckon? How, how, how far would you do in a commute? I, how I, long? How long would you do in a commute? I used to live out at Salisbury, yeah. uh, around that way. That? Uh, that was peak hour, 30 minutes for what's that, 8 k's, 9 right. k's. So, so in, in, in the Lily and Plyne car, here to Perigium Beach is 17 minutes. Wow. That's that's insane. So why would you live at Bridgian Beach? Oh, I would have Noosa, right? Yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Um, so well, there's the options there. So yeah. it's the one thing, and you don't need to, there's not a single piece of reinforced concrete highway in the sky or anything. No. L- literally, there's once you actually do the interface to the air traffic control system, there's actually no nothing else required. It'll be the cheapest road we ever built because it'll be instantly reconfigurable, instantly and infinitely reconfigurable. Mm. So, and you know, I, I, I talked to lots of people who poo-pooed the idea and I say, well, okay, so uh, how, many, how many flying cars could you put in a cubic kilometre of airspace? Um, and they, they can't answer, which is fair enough, you don't often think about that, hmm. but the answer is 4,000. And more importantly, you'd be, you'd be no closer than 50 metres to another car. Five, when was the last time you were 50 metres from another car on a road? No. Never? No. So, um, with the appropriate systems, safety can be massively increased. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's not not as not as silly as people think. Well, that's not even to stop to mention the cost of roadworks and and all those things that are going into it. I mean, that compared to what some air traffic controllers, it must be way cheaper to do it. There. Well, it'll, it'll be you know it's software that the government runs. So it'll hmm. be a couple of billion dollars to change it because they just they, you know, remember I don't like public servants. They're, hmm. all, they're essentially hopeless. You look what it cost to not not even change some some you know Queensland health payroll software for Christ's sakes. Yeah. So. Um, but that being said, I mean, they, they shouldn't say that the 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 systems that control air traffic control, you know, they're very serious systems. They, they do cost real money, so it will be, you know, it could be ten billion dollars hmm. to never have to actually put down a serious road in Australia ever again. Oh, one of the best investments they could ever make. Well, you know, they said they were MBN two, so be careful. <laughs> so. <laughs> True. Well, let's talk about uh, you and business now, Steve, if you don't mind. What's the biggest challenge you've ever had, and how did you overcome it? And I know that's a very very open broad. No, question, look, I mean, I've been quite lucky. I've had um. I'm not a serial entrepreneur, I'm a plural entrepreneur. I've had two businesses. Hmm. I had an internet service provider in Adelaide and I had a, a um, co-founder, a, a wholesale telecommunications carrier here in Brisbane. Hmm. So um, I have this business now, which is an investment house, but it's, it's a very, you know, I don't regard it as a standard business by any stretch. We back other businesses. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the, you know, so in those businesses there, I, I suppose we, we, we face lots of challenges. Um, in general, the only really hard thing about business is selling stuff. To be honest, if you can sell what you, if you can, people buy what you're selling, then you, you've, you know, nine tenths your problems are solved. Um, convincing them, you know, finding them, and then finding the potential customer, and then convincing that potential customer to buy what you've got is really hard. Mm-hmm. So that's the problem that a lot of businesses face. Staffing's a potential perennial issue. Um, mm-hmm. To be honest, uh, and in my business, is the biggest issue with the fact that we were still recovering from part of it. So when I started in 94, in my first business, we still actually had a, a legislative monopoly telecommunications provider, Telstra. Mm. It might have been called Telstra. No, they just changed the name to Telstra at that point in time. What were they previously Telstra? <laughs> you are young, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, am. Telecom. Telecom, they were. Um, or Telecom Australia. <laughs> I can't believe that you asked that. <laughs> um, so, uh, and even, even you know, post-97 uh, legislation that the Howard government put through, which was essentially Beasley legislation, um, uh, rebadged, but, you know, so there's, there's props on both sides of politics there, um, was, was really good. It's one of the best stuff in the world. It's, it got changed and monkeyed with ever since, and, and they made it, monke- monkeyed with ever since, they made it quite bad. But um, it really brought forward an age of competitive telecommunications that was fantastic. But we still had Telstra to deal with now. You know, when your only supply is the biggest competitor, yeah, um, it's horrible. Yeah, so absolutely. And we've reinflicted that ourselves with NBM. We've gone, we've gone back to a monopoly supplier of fixed line telecommunication services gleefully because we forgot the name telecom. <laughs> essentially, you know, bad you bad. can blame my generation. You, you know, you, exactly. No, you can because yeah. you, you're the ones who are out there demanding NBM. You're demanding the taxpayers actually give you a cheaper, faster internet connection because mm. you just and then then you then you gleefully wanted a monopoly. You 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 know if you knew what it was like pre competition days. Um, we had months to get phone lines fixed where you were paying you know, just extraordinary amounts for everything because it had to support the monopoly. Yeah. Um, we've gone back there, happily. And honestly, everyone who ever liked MBN, you got what you were asked for, sucked in, you can keep it. Do you think that'll change in you know, sort of a few years down the track just like Telecom did? I, I, 
Or it's just fibre optics is too, ex- too expensive to lay down? No, it's not. Well, it is too expensive. That's, hard. That's the problem. The problem the problem's on the technology issue. It's an expense issue. Yeah. Um, and because it's so expensive, they've got to recover the costs. And the way they recover the costs is they charge for bandwidth that, that actually has no inherent cost to provide. Mm. And as a result, service providers actually buy less in order to control costs. So they use congestion as a cost control mechanism. Yeah. Um, Will that change? I think the biggest chance has got the changes when, unfortunately, probably when Bill Shorten becomes Prime Minister in a few months' time, and um, he should declare a budget emergency, he should declare an ambient emergency, and he should take the $40 billion, and numbers vary, between 29 and a half to $40 billion, and write it off and put it on the budget year one as a deficit. And that way it'll free it up. It'll actually, and, and, and the next day, MBM will go 10 times faster because it's an accounting issue, not a technical issue. There's a long podcast that one, but anyone who, <laughs> anyone wants to talk to me about it can, and, 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 and I'm happy to talk through it. But unless you actually know the background, and background doesn't mean that you've configured Wi-Fi and DHCP at home. Mm. Background actually means you know how this stuff works. Yeah. So because um, it is complicated, it's a very complicated issue, and you just can't you just can't wave it off by saying, well, that's a technical issue, or that's for nerds. Um, that that's got us in the, the trouble we're in at the moment. Yeah. And do you think it's just the problem is a lack of people with that experience in the government that's sort of caused this, or? Or is it just the just the strategy they picked? It's and a lack of people who forgot deep. the word telecom. To be quite blunt, yeah, um, that's probably the best analog ever. The yeah. fact that people have forgotten what Telstra used to be called, because that that for people who were around at the time, it it doesn't bring back pleasant memories. Mm. They bring everything but. Yeah. So, um, uh, it, you know, it was it was essentially politicians playing to people's greed, and we let them do that. So yeah. we're, we're as much to blame. We as a polity. Um, politicians came out and said hey you can have this really really fast interconnection that actually costs a lot of money but will somehow make it cost a lot not not, not much mm. and, and of course just, everyone's going woo without yeah yeah it's just snake oil right yeah it, you pay for it yeah we're paying for it now oh exactly yeah we pay for it one way or another on to on to i guess a segue to millennials in business um what do you see the main problem being with the millennial entrepreneur or, or a younger entrepreneur coming through is there a, a lot of people i've spoken to so far feel that a big a lot of the drama is coming from the now generation and how we we're under the impression that we can make a business and then within months sort of flip it for millions are, are you seeing that much in your space or is yeah, it you, you see that i mean i think that that bleeds away pretty fast yeah um <laughs> they come to realization pretty quickly yeah um you know, CB Insights, a, a, a fantastic analyst organisation out of the US, actually released some research not about a year ago, a year and a half ago. Hmm. Average time between start and successful exits eight point seven years. Wow! Uh, Atlassian right now has been out it for seventeen years. They're much everyone thinks they're an overnight success. Yeah. Uh, my first business was six years. My second business was nine. Wow. So, um, uh, uh, yeah. Look, you know, if you get into this. If you get into thinking it's an overnight success, you, you, you're actually probably a muppet because you've done that research. And, you know, it's like you can't really help that person. Mm. No, exactly. They've got, to, they've got to educate themselves before they can be helped. That's it. Yeah. Um, what made you want to start River City Labs? Where did that, where did that all come about? Um, so I, I saw an issue with, I suppose, a lack of um, a, a place for um, entrepreneurs and early stage, entre- early stage entrepreneurs to... to to, to, f- to focus, to congregate in order to come and actually find out more to network. Um, the benefits of networking is massive. I, I've helped start you know, four at least industry associations over the years um, because of, I knew I wasn't the smartest guy in the room and I knew how to get the smartest people in the room and it was to start an association. So um, um, associations or industry collective efforts would be a better description for it, but yeah. Um, so uh, I looked around and and you know there was uh, a, an organisation funded by Queensland government in the UQ called iLab, which is there's a different iLab now. This iLab Part One was out on Coronation Drive, and it was was at Tong somewhere. Sorry, it was actually sort of sort of quite I don't know, you know it was sort of white ceiling tile, grey carpet tile, very corporate, horrible sort of. They, they call themselves an incubator, mm. and, and an incubator is something you put a baby in to keep it alive. Yeah, if you know what I mean. They're mm. not, that, you know, it's it's, and they're very handy things to keep baby alive. Don't get me wrong, but they're not. It's not a place you want to stick a business, right? It's not, they're not there to be kept alive. Mm. And so it was, a, it was a mindset change that was required as well. Um, and so I looked at that and thought, oh, well, okay, we can't be that hard. And so uh, gave it a crack. Yeah. And uh, did you see success straight away with that? I, I know it was never successful. No. It cost me, cost me, 
fucking about a million bucks over six years to keep alive to wow. start and keep alive it was always planned so, to run not for profit wasn't it but hopefully just keep afloat or yeah not for profit doesn't mean whacking big loss though no absolutely so not. um we were very successful not for profit because we made a whacking big loss yeah um i i, I liked it uh, don't get me wrong i've, I've got a lot of uh, i've got a lot, a lot of pride in what was what happened there and, and we, we sold that late last year to uh, uh australian computer society acs mm. you know they were uh, we were in a process we were approached by a couple of organizations about where we would be buy it i'm like not making much money yeah um interesting you know sort of low slash no growth almost in some respects um community organization um so i started a process in order to uh, uh find the next steward i suppose to someone to take over that sort of what it was cost me about 150 to 200 grand a year to keep running and um and and also i was i've been at it for six years at that point i was just out of ideas yeah you know, it, it'd gone to a point gotten there you know i was at some stage, I thought maybe I was the thing holding it back because I was, you know, uh, maybe a little stuck in my ways, um, and just even getting fresh ideas in would have been helpful. And out of that, ACS um, came through, and, and I think they've they've picked it up. They've they understood that their organisation probably needed some catalyst to help them uh, change, and that ACS and that and that RCL may have been part of that solution, and uh, we did a deal. Yeah. It's just it's an interesting interesting thing to buy, especially running it at such a great loss. You know, with some great backers as well. Is it what, what was their reason for purchasing it? Was it was it for the name or? Ah, uh, we'd have to ask them. Obviously, I've got you know I've got uh, we've got an agreement between us, which includes substantial confidentiality. Of course, yeah. But um, if you understand ACS, yeah. You know, do you know who ACS are? I didn't know who Telecom were, so you probably don't know who ACS <laughs> are either, right? They're the they're the um 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 they're the uh, the peak. Uh, peak uh, employment representation group for ICT workers in Australia. Yeah. I might have that slightly wrong. Um, sorry, Andy, if I have Andy Johnson, CEO of ACS. Um, but they've got 45,000 members, who are all technically, all, all technical background, 45,000 members. Mm, okay. They do a lot of the, the government visa work with respect to assessing inbound applications for ICT roles in Australia yeah. and, and a bunch of other stuff. So they are the, the peak and, and the peak ICT um, employment group in Australia. And the one th- the only thing that the tech startup, one of the biggest things that the tech startup sector needs is lots of really bright, technically trained people. Yeah. And they've got a membership base of the most really bright, technically trained people in Australia. Oh. So it made a lot of sense. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Makes sense. Something I'd love to talk to you about is work-life balance. Um, definitely, you, you seem to have done that extremely well over the years, and especially now with, uh, with the family coming through and the twins and your other lovely daughter. Has it been a challenge uh, all through ever since starting uh, your first business to, to yeah. balance that, or has it always been... Well, we didn't have a family until the last five years, so hmm. was, you know, before that it was pretty easy in some respects because yeah. um, there was you know, nothing really, but we... Uh, yeah, look, it's hard. I mean, we, you know, your business is tough. Um, you know, have, have a work-life balance. They probably have a life-work balance would be a better description for it. But you know, when you're in business, so you've, you've got, to, got to give it your best, right? You, it's literally, you're pouring almost every part of your soul and spirit into this thing. Hmm. So you want it to work. Um, and so you can make yourself ex- exceptionally physically and mentally un- unwell if you do that wrong. Exactly, so, I see a lot of burnout. Yeah, so... Uh, um, but at the same time, it's a hard thing. It's not meant to be easy. If it was easy and it's worthwhile doing, and it's hard, and it's it, it's it's a hard thing, and not everyone's going to do it, not everyone's going to complete it. Mm. Um, if it was easy, lots of people would do it, lots of people would finish it. So, um, in some respects, I, I don't mind that. You know, things that are worthwhile usually are difficult. And if you don't want difficult, then try something else. Yeah, go the so, easier route. Yeah, go. I don't know. Join, join the public service. <laughs> uh, do you think the public service will ever change? No. No. Just the only so way to change it is to is to is to radically defund it mm. in, in various areas. So um, we need less public servants. If, if there's less people there to do stuff, we have to have less regulation, and we're overregulated. We're just unbelievably regulated. So um, stupidly regulated. Mm. Um, you know, they like to think we're serfs. It's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. When when it comes to um when it comes to investing in uh, transition level investments now, so how many how many investments have you made total this year? Did you say it was well, this year? So uh, we've only got a couple away this year, but yeah. I mean we've got quite a few on the boil at the moment. Yeah. 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 What's been uh, What's been the most exciting one for you so far? Is there anything that you've um that sort of pitched to and you've just gone wow? That's not something I'd ever ever would have thought. Nah. Look. Um. It's exciting. Uh. I've learned not to get too excited about ideas because it doesn't matter how good the idea is. It's all about the team, and the execution, and the market, and the timing, and, and a whole a whole bunch of stuff. To be honest, mm. uh, competitors, you know. So, 
you know, we've got one that's growing like a, you know, it's, grow, it's got a substantial user growth at the moment, which is really, really fun to watch. So um, you don't try and get too excited about very many of them. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very high mortality business, early stage investing. You don't get too attached to these things, to be quite blunt. Yeah. What's the uh, what's the goal? Do you do you go in with a set goal every year? I, I heard in another interview you were making about thirty percent year on year. Um, how many of them sort of? Did do I say there thirty percent year on year? Is that thirty percent uh, year on year on your investments? Was that right? was that? Oh, so, yeah. Well, that's what everyone turns a target. That I mean, that's it's a very it's a, you know, well, if you just stick money in the bank, you'll get sub five percent, right? Depending yeah. how aggressive you are, right? If you yeah, go to yeah. some sort of managed investments, getting a managed fundish type thing, some you know you can on capital you might might, might make eight, nine, ten percent, if you know what I mean. So, hmm. so for, for all the risk you're taking in these things, so the more risk you take, the more you should get. Mm-hmm. So what sort of premium should you get for your risk? And, and it, you know, probably should be double or triple. Yeah. So everyone's going for sort of 25% plus in this space. Absolutely. That's what they're targeting. Whether they get that's another story, right? Yeah, yeah. So with um, so do you kind of go in with the expectation that X amount probably won't get to the stage to you, pay back the investment? Or? Well, you do, but you don't, you know. Um, you of don't course get, you back you, them you, 100%. Yeah, you don't yeah. go in there thinking, oh, I think this one will die, so I'll do the investment anyway. You obviously, no. you make a good faith investment at every stage. Mm-hmm. And what, uh, what do you look for specifically? Is there a relative trend or foundations that you look for in each investment? No. No? I mean, we're typically early stage. We write checks. Uh, our biggest investment quantity in, in the sort of tech startup space there is sub one million bucks. We usually start with the first checks anywhere from 50 grand to uh, you know, 200, maybe 300, um, depending. So we might, we might follow on with another half mil after that type yeah. of thing. Um, but then we usually dial ourselves out. It gets a bit too rich for us at that point. And plus, you know, we, we, like, we like buying early because it, it actually, we, we get more value. Mm. So the earlier you buy, the more risk you take, but also the more value you get. Mm. So that tends to be where we sit. What question am I answering again? I'm <laughs> you're, you're answering the question of just uh, how much you're looking at getting back and do you kind of go in with the expectation that only a few will succeed throughout that space? Yeah, I mean, we, we, it's portfolio theory. We have a lot because we, we know that we know that not, what, all won't work. Mm. So uh, we had one exit started last year. This one's got massive confidentiality clauses attached. I still want to talk about it. <laughs> um, so it, you know, it's, it was a, it's dose me. It was acquired by a US NASDAQ listed company called Tabula Russa, TRHC, mm. um, Tabula Russa Healthcare. Um, the on market announcement was 30 mil US. Um, wow. It was contingent, two thirds up front, one third contingent, and they should fall over the contingencies. They look pretty easy. So. Um, and, you know, and, and then I would start getting the territory I can't talk about, but it was, a, it was an exceptional deal for us. Now, Dose Me was run by a doctor, wasn't it? And they... uh, yeah, no, uh, it was started initially, one of the co-founders, he, he left the business, he was a doctor, he was mm. a pharmacist. No, no, he was a, um, he was a, uh, pretty, he was, he was a mathematician, a statistician type thing. So there was, uh, there were pharmacists, there were people in the right field. So they were in the pharmacy slash, um, it was called a... Uh, it's like a cross between a pharmacist and a, and a, and a, and a statistician slash um, uh, we've got people who are on studies called it farm kinetics. Farm kinetics. Farm kinetics. So they're yeah. people who understand the results of drug studies, I suppose, yeah. in some respects. Because the whole program was to it was to be able to sort of automate the process of knowing what dosages to give to a particular individuals going. Yeah, well, it's to calculate. I would say automate. Yeah, definitely to calculate. Yeah. Um, so uh, using sort of statistical, very well known statistical methods. As opposed to basically what the doctor feels is a good thing on the day. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's such an such an amazing thing. It, when I when I first heard about it, which was through this podcast, I, I just I couldn't believe it hadn't already been done. Like it's such an amazing idea. Well, it's, anything in the healthcare space is hard to sell though at the same time, right? So yeah, it's a very true. very very hard sector to sell into. It's it's in some respects they're very almost IT resistant. They're staffed by a bunch of people who 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 are who maybe have an overinflated sense of their own intelligence. <laughs> Maybe. Um, maybe. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's 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 doctors and doctors and surgeons, but like they're incredibly smart people. Oh, they yeah. are incredibly smart people. You know, does that mean they're incredibly smart at IT? No, but, but they think they are. Yeah. So, um, but you know, everything in time. You know, it, it it just means it takes time and space. As I said before, everything's about timing. Is what? Well, not everything. A lot of things are about timing. Mm. You've got to. You might have the best team, the best solution, the best everything. But if the market's not ready for you, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, no one's going to buy it. Mm, exactly. Yeah, it goes back to the thing you said. If if someone's willing to buy your product, that's nine tenths of the problem solved. Exactly. It. So, in a world five to sort of five to ten years from now, what would like Steve Bax's ideal world be? Like, what would you be doing? And and obviously, apart from the flying cars, what would you like to see? Oh, that's a good question. I think about that one ever. Um, 
Flying cars would be awesome, you know. Okay, you've excluded that. Um, <laughs> Thought I'd make it challenging for you. Yeah, uh, I'd like to see substantially through our current telecommunications issues. That's that's unbelievably holding us back. Mm. Um, um, the biggest self-inflicted injury ever. Uh, you know, I would uh, look. I, I think that the biggest thing, one of the bigger things that could, a few of the bigger things that could help the Australian scene a lot would be to get some of these companies that are just coming through now to be to be awesomely successful um, you know so to get uh, any one of the current sort of companies probably started the last five to seven years starting to you know uh, record revenues of hundreds of millions of dollars and or you know raise money on valuations of billions of dollars mm. um, in it so you make it make them a real valuation not some of all these empty freaking unicorn valuations you're seeing at the moment <laughs> So, well, that's no, true. No, 100%. Um, I've seen a lot of and them. Then, and then get them actually to, to, to really raise the flag here in Australia. Like, literally get them to maybe list on the ASX. Or if they, if they do list on, on NASDAQ, list dual list on the ASX. Hmm. Um, uh, we need those lead stories that encourage and incentivize people and some of the look up to them and say, right, I'm going to do that. Hmm. I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be that. So we, we need a lot more of that coming through. To get there, we need to do a bunch of things. And we need to, I think we need a, we need a, um, uh, we, we need some common sense changes with respect to some easy stuff out there. We need some common sense changes with respect to employee share option plans. It's still a bloody minefield, which is ridiculous. Um, it's an easy one to fix. Um, we need to straighten out our uh, immigration issues. And, you know, the Im- immigration, that, that it, it's such a charged subject, especially after Christchurch last week. But, you know, you've got to talk about it um, courageously and, and hope people just see, you know, see what you're saying, not, not what they think you're saying. Um, the reality is, you know, under the previous 457 visa, for example, you could bring in a hairdresser on a goddamn 457 visa or a waitress. That was ridiculous. So the mm. system was broken, right? Absolutely. So they had to do something. They went, they went too far and, and, and their political enemies made hay of that and didn't help the situation. And so it's that charge that's really, it, it's that charge that's really hard to actually fix. But the reality is, as I said before, is the tech startup sector is, is its feedstock is young people, bright, young, smart people. So we need to bring them in in their droves. Mm. Um, we actually need to make this place a, a place that's desirable to come set up a business and, and work from. So, uh, you know, over half the businesses started in Silicon Valley aren't from um, uh, people born in the US. They're from immigrants to the US. Mm. Um, it's an immigrant nation in the US anyway, so that makes some sense in some respects. Uh, so, you know, we've just sort of got to get over that. And, and so wherever the talent is, we've just got to bring it here and make it easy to do. Um, we're not doing that. I mean, honestly, so when, when's this going to air? Oh, this will go to air, not this Thursday, but next Thursday. Excellent. So, so we're about to go into a federal election in this country soon. We're, we're probably going to elect a Bill Short and let ALP, which would just be a disaster for the economy. And he's one of the reasons it'll be a disaster. And that's because they're looking at actually uh, halving the capital gains tax discount on, on, on asset sales. So everyone frames this in the context of the housing debate. But right now, if you start a tech startup, for example, right, as a founder, um, and you end up selling it down the road for profit, um, you get a 50% providing you've held that share for more than 12 months, which let's assume the business has been going for more than 12 months, um, you get a 50% discount in the capital gains tax. So if you've made as a founder $5 million, right? Um, you only pay you, you only pay tax, you get a discount on half the capital gains. So you only pay tax on two and a half million of the $5 million in, that you've actually made, mm. okay? And w- at whatever rate that is, whatever your concessional rate is, probably you know 47 cents in the dollar or Give or take Medicare, whatever it's going to be at the time. Yeah. They, they're going to halve that again, so they're going to. They're actually going to so it's only twenty five percent is is available for the discount. So right now, you, for all the people who spent those eight point seven years building these businesses, you're actually going to tax penalise them more, um, which I find just to be grubbily envious. Now I'm an investor, right? So I, I actually use all investors. We have structures available to us, so we pay no capital gains tax. There's something called ESVCLP, Early Stage Venture Capital Limited Partnership, right? It's a fully, I, I don't know if it's HEO, but federal government backed, I think it's between HEO and Commerce and, and Treasury, they, they sign off on these uh, on these funds. There's an, investors in those funds don't pay capital gains tax. So the investors don't, but the poor old founders who started the company do. Yeah. And there's something that the Turnbull government did actually well out of the NISA package, which is called ESIC, Early Stage Innovation Company, where there's a 20% tax offset available to an investor. Plus, you don't pay capital gains. So we're investing in these companies that we're not paying capital gains in, but the poor buggers who are starting them actually yeah. are. Yeah. Well, they're paying more, I shouldn't say. They're always paying it before. Yeah. So um, it's rotten. 
it's just, it's, it's actually just really really rotten. Yeah. So well, everyone like, needs to talk to him about it. No, no, people don't like the current the, the current conservative government. It's, it's like, well, just have a good hard think about who you're going to put in their place, mm. because there are worse options out there. I and mean, if you care about tech startup, there's there's nothing good coming out of this mob. There's nothing good coming out of them at all. No. no. What was the the first business that you sold? Um, the tax was astronomical, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, but there was no capital gains discount at all back then. So, so it was, it was straight fifty, 50 cents in the dollar. Oh well, yeah, forty seven hundred was it? Yeah, close to fifty cents in the dollar. Wow, gutcha, a- a- absolutely gutcha. Absolutely, and that's the um, thing. And people see these big figures, but what they don't understand is how long and how much time, yeah. blood, sweat, and tears have gone into creating. And, and as an enterprise. entrepreneur, what you do is you know, and I, I have no issue with people working in companies. And this is this is not taking a shot. Anyone is actually an employee as opposed to an entrepreneur or owner, but. Um, you know, the, the employees get there for their work day, work week, you know, eight to five, eight to four, whatever it might be, you know, roughly sort of, you know, probably 10 hours either side or let's say 45 hours a week, mm. right? Um, and I know it's supposed to be 38, but, you know... Let's be real. Yeah, let, let's be <laughs> yeah. real, right? The entrepreneur gets up at six in the morning, spends the first two hours checking email, right? Sits in the back of a car, does work in the back of the car, gets in, gets like a tome and night after his kids are in bed, does that for six and a half days a week for five years. Yeah. You, you cannot equate the same thing. No. If you are equating the same thing, it just means you're envious and you're greedy and you, and you actually don't care. You don't actually understand that people need to be rewarded for their effort. And if you think that's not the case, then maybe you should go to Venezuela or Russia and work out how it actually works. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's the same thing as you were saying about uh, about the investments expecting to make a lot more in the startup space. I mean, the more you risk you put in, the more that you deserve to get back. Hence, why you know they deserve these big, and, and these businesses, of especially tech startups. I mean, they 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 feed stock as people, and what that actually means is we pay a lot of wages, and there's a lot of tax goes in wages. It, it it's it vast quantity. It's I have to actually I should do the numbers for our portfolio and understand actually how much of the expense in these businesses and wages. We probably do that pretty easily. Hmm. Um, but be astronomical. It, it'd, be, it'd be well over fifty, well over fifty yeah. percent. Um, well, you know, food business, for example, in a fast food chain, it's about thirty percent of the money goes to wages. About thirty percent, that yeah, about thirty percent cogs, thirty percent wages, thirty percent rent. Wow. So in, in the poor old business owner of the day, maybe left with ten percent of which he's got to pay three cents tax, three percent tax, or thirty percent tax on. So maybe left with seven percent. So when you, when you think about people that they're running businesses don't go, ooh, ooh, that business owner, what a big wig, fat what, fat cat, whatever it might be. Yeah. Which are like, if you've got a really successful fast food business, you're making 7% of the revenue. Yeah. Now, that's all good, but if you get, if you get it wrong by 1% on either of those ones there, all of a sudden you're making 3%. Yeah. Right, and they're scary. At they're, 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 that point in time, you can't pay your mortgage. And this is this is the risk that the standard is trying yeah, to no, everyone else, see. Everyone else gets paid first, right? Yeah. So this is the whole thing about, the whole thing about entrepreneurs. Um, this is in no legal order, but definitely employees get paid first. And, and you can say, you know, some companies don't pay their employees right. Well, most do, and they all should. So don't tar us all by the 1% of them who stuff up their wage bill, right? Employees get paid first. Um, vendors get paid next. So uh, your cost of goods, for example, your rent, you know, your every other bill that comes in the business, right? Then the tax man gets paid. And then you, then you get the profit after that. You after get the everything else 7%. is done. <laughs> everything, else, everything else is done. You get that right. Um, and if you have a wildly successful business, you might have, you might have twenty percent, twenty five percent net profit after tax, which is an amazing business, right? There are very few of those around. So you know they're mostly down below the, the sort of ten percent mark. I guess uh, shedding a bit more positive light on, on the whole scenario, do you have any, if, if if a new entrepreneur was coming up to you today and he, he just said, do you have any lessons for me, Steve, on I'm just about to get started, what would you, what lessons would you give him? Start, just do it. You learn more by doing. Yeah. Don't listen to old people. <laughs> Seriously. Just, just shut up and execute. Well, look, um, I always, people say, how, um, at what age do you encourage them to start entrepreneurship? And, and I always, always say as young as possible. Mm. And that leads to all sorts of issues. You know, what's young, what's young, what's old? And all the old people get upset when you tell them a number and it's just, oh, it's just tragic. It's just, um, like my opinion actually counts. Um, but my belief is that uh, um, you should, if you're going to start a business, you should wait until you've acquired the appropriate skills, right? And, and that doesn't mean an education, although it could. But it means the appropriate skills to, to do what you want to do. And you've built a network, and you've started at least started to build a network that's going to help you. Yeah. A good way to do that is to go to, for example, go to university or some form of structured education and, and get to know people yeah. and, and build your network as well as your skills at the same time. Not the only way, um, but you know, have at least have the appropriate skills, and you really help yourself if you have the appropriate uh, the, the appropriate network. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the joys of being in being in a world where there's so many 
great co-working spaces around and things like that it's, it's a lot easier to build your network yeah, now than it was a large reason why i started the podcast is because i noticed a lot of people were quite heavily introverted and they'd love to get advice from people especially the people that they look up to but it's been really hard for them because they haven't known how to really exert themselves and go speak to people so the whole point of me starting this was so i could I'm luckily i'm quite extroverted so i could speak to these people and kind of offer advice in each in each sort of episode for them mm. so that was kind of that was the whole idea around starting this but i completely agree network is is everything you mm. know when you do have those down days and and things like that then it's your network that help, helps you out it's your network that gets you through the hardest times so so what um what does steve like to do apart from uh, apart from the fishing and and helicoptering how do you spend your spare time most of the days Lots of family stuff, or oh, no, not as much as I'd like, no. um, but uh, you know, trolley. So, um, well, you know, you <laughs> got a young family. You get home at night and they, you, you're feeding and being bathed and put to bed. And by that time, by the time that's all done at seven thirty-eight, you're a bit exhausted and you go to bed yourself. Yeah. So, um, get in the morning, take the dog for a walk, um, do the morning routine, come in. You know, it's just normal life, really. Yeah. Do you have a uh, like? What, what's your long term goal? Is there is there a plan to sort of uh, like get out of all this life and and sort of spend more time with the family down the track? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah, there is, I suppose. So, yeah. um, uh, how that's done? It, it's the investing game is really tough, right? It's literally yeah. it's you know, it's almost ten years between exits. Yeah. You know, um, so for ten years you basically pay expenses, and then then every eight point seven years you get some revenue. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so sort of shed some reality light on the investing game, doesn't it? Yeah, and I shouldn't say because you know it, it, there's a, there's a there's a series of investments that move through that pipeline. That's not always the case. But I mean, the dose one we had we had dose me from so that fifteen so three years maybe fifteen to eighteen. So that was a bit unusual. Hmm. We had a couple of side, we've had a couple of sideways exits. We made twenty percent overall, which is not to be after about over two years. So ten percent year on year. Oh, big ones too actually. So they were actually quite big. So that was wasn't too bad. Hmm. Um, we've got a couple now staring down potential. Uh, acquisition, at least one, two staring down acquisition at the moment. Whether we take, whether they take that or not, will be interesting. Yeah. So, um, so you need to, you know, seven staff here. You can probably imagine what seven staff cost to run. Um, well, you don't know who telecom is. So much as we can actually imagine what seven staff cost to run. <laughs> um, but you know, it's a substantial operation. So you need to be generating revenues to actually want to want to keep paying that. Yeah. Um, so we'll get that, you know, get that stabilised and give some options. Absolutely. Was is the plan always to sort of stay in stay in Australia with all this? Were you? Yeah, don't know actually. Um, I'd love to go back and lived lived in the US for a year in 08, 09. Yeah. Um, I've been back there a lot. We've been back there a lot. Yeah. So I uh, don't know. That was during the Google stint. Yeah. 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 How was Google? Is it an interesting sort of? Yeah, very interesting. I mean, it, it taught you know, it, it teaches you a lot. They taught me a lot working there. Yeah. Um, well, some of the as you were saying with uh, getting the smartest minds in the room. I mean, that would have been. The creme de la creme of the smartest minds in the room. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. They'd be like in a room full of doctors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so, so, so. Well, no, no. Google is an amazing <laughs> business. They have, mm. they have amazing, they have amazing patent protected technology and even some a lot of trade secrets probably that, that they use to to root monopoly revenues. Um, and so, I've, I see a lot of startups who talk about you know a lot of their their um, plans. I'll reference and try and emulate Google and stuff. I'm like, you know, when you've got like, I don't know, what is now what, twenty six billion dollars a quarter in, in revenue? Yeah, you, you too can emulate Google. Yeah, but you can have these projects that you work on and scrap left, right, yeah. and center. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. It's a, it's you know, you can. They're, they're outliers, and, and fair enough. And I think a lot of their work practices are actually quite terrible. Um, so, um, it, which is more indicative of them being an American company than them being Google? Um, no, American companies in in my very generalised view, tend to throw people at problems and not really care about process. So therefore, you get a lot of valueless labour. Labour is mostly cheap in the US. It's a damn sight cheaper than here in, in every sense. Yeah. So um, as a result, when it's cheap, you tend to have an excess of it, right? So, and that, you know, it's still people. I can talk about it late being labour, right? But the reality is it's actually people. Um, you probably shouldn't talk about people in, in such a r- removed context. Yeah. Um, but I've just seen them deployed so poorly in the situations that are actually quite probably morally sort of frustrating for them. Uh, morally, men- mentally frustrating for them. Probably morally so, in some sense. Yeah, not about morally. I was from the wrong choice of words. Um, so, you know, you, you want to give people a really good working date where they know what they have to do to, 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 to achieve a productive outcome. More of a structure. Um, yeah, definitely more of a structure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, large parts of Google I saw just kind of lacked threw a, them. De- definitely lacked a, a productive structure, but they didn't have to. Have that, the, their point, I mean, to their to their benefit and to you know, the, this is why they're good. They don't have to be productive. Yeah. 
So. Was there was there benefits to to working for I, I guess companies in the US compared to companies in Australia? Is there any good takeaways that we could use here? Do you think? Um, working wise, um, I mean, their, their um, industrial relations is, is a lot different. Um, you know, working at will contracts, so you can be asked not to come tomorrow. That's it. That's how much notice you have. We're wow. in California; it's a bit different. But yeah. um, that, that's a, that's amazing that they not amazing. That's crazy that they can do that. I guess good in some ways, though. I mean, there's bad things about. Yeah, I think it's good in, in that you know you can, but it's a very, very, very mobile labour market. Um, you see some downsides that they've got some social issues. It's not just related to their employment contracts and uh, their employment uh, conditions, but a lot of other stuff. Um, I, I think one of their bigger detractors is healthcare, and, and as, as a late libertarian, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with their approach to healthcare. Mm. Um, in that, I actually think in, in, a, in a workplace sense, that because of your healthcare tends to be tied to your work, tends to be tied to your employment, mm. and so um, a couple of downsides to that are that if you lose your job, you lose your healthcare. It's yeah. a bad thing. But the other downside of that is it actually prevents labour mobility. So I had really good friends in the US. He used to drive a crane at a, uh, at a, at a wind farm, or well, you know, sort of horribly horrible things that wind farms are. But we'll talk about that later if you want. Um, and he hated his job, absolutely hated his job. Yeah, there's only one redeeming benefit to his entire job, health care. And yeah. so he's miserable for years and, yeah. until he found another job he could eventually move to that had the similar level of health care. You know, he's driving a truck, that's fine. You know, I, I'm, I'm not having a crack at his, at his, at his occupation. No, so but he hated it, so... Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if there was some form of what they call single payer or central payer or something like that where you could everyone pay into a central fund, Medicare-esque in Australia, mm. then at least, you know, you'd have labour mobility, which I think would be, just in an economic sense, we'd be really curious for the US. But they're, a large part of their, 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 their liberty-based uh, understanding of, of, of government is the fact that you can't tell them what to do. You, you should have to pay your own way, which I'm a massive agreement with, because in Australia we've gone too far the other direction where... You can just, yeah, yeah. freeload, basically. Yeah, so with, well, I think there's, there's, you know, there's, there's, and I'm sort of okay with, you know, I'm okay with a few things, safety nets, other bits and pieces, but we take it too far, it's, you know. Mm. The fact that we're regarding our safety nets actually ridiculous. We've actually have to give incentives for people to actually want to do things. Yeah. Um, you know, we give incentives for, you know, th- there's, there's actually no downside for you doing silly stuff that puts yourself into the health system. Yeah. So you can drink too much, eat too much. Um, I want to say smoke too much, because to be quite honest, the tax on cigarettes pays for like four times the cost of lung cancer every year. Yeah. So I think insure, the smokers have self-insured, and they should, everyone should smoke because they'd probably fix the budget. <laughs> and in all seriousness. Yeah. Um, and so in the US, so that, that, that's where they hang out. The US response is, well, you have to get insurance. If you're going to do something risky, like you can ride around on the US with, without a, without a uh, helmet on a motorcycle. Yeah. That's fine. But if, if you fall off, guess what? Your insurance company's not, not going to cover it, right? Your insurance company, they'll pass you the bill for that and say, oops, yeah. none of the head injuries. We're not going to cover any of that head injury, right? You should have a helmet on. So, and I sort of get that. So it, it's, actually reinf- it's actually reinforcing better behaviour through commercial outcomes as opposed to government mandating things that then police have to race around and at gunpoint arrest you for. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, that's a long way away from the US um, human, you know, uh, uh, employment conditions. But um, I think it reinforces a lot of, you know, how they conduct themselves as a society. Yeah, I, I did last time I was in the US, which was which was a few months ago now. I, I honestly, it almost it feel, almost feels like another planet. Like the problems that they've got over there, especially with the, the drug addiction problems and everything like mm-hmm. that that you see all through the streets. I mean, it's and a lot of the reasons. Were you for in San Fran or something? Were you? Or? No, I wasn't in San Fran. Um, I went through LA, which yep. was really bad. Um, been through New York as well, which is equally as bad. Austin, Texas, which actually turned out to be the worst that I'd yeah, seen. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So and and that and that was that was crazy because I thought out of all the places, Austin, Texas, would really have it all figured out, but. Not at all. So it, you're going to be unemployed and homeless. You might as well be unemployed and homeless somewhere where it's warm. Yeah, true. That's so. a good point. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> it's easy to stay cool than it is to yeah. find a blanket, right? That's it. Yeah, but just just seeing that, and I mean, they relate a lot of that back to the issues with healthcare. So I, I think it definitely does have does have an effect on, on the, the healthcare. I mean, there's an amazing amount of people who have been bankrupted due to healthcare costs, um, mm-hmm. and well, I think you know, there's some there's some inherent sort of inequities there. But you, I, I do understand. Um, yeah. It, 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 it is not something for to be sold in this podcast, but it's, it's one of the more unfortunate artifacts of the US system as well. They, they treat people with respect to healthcare, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you have a poison of choice, Steve? Like, uh, some people poison love cars, choice. some oh, people right, love, yeah. you know, watches, whatever it may be. Like airplanes, mate. Airplanes? What, like yeah. The most expensive bloody things you've ever invented. <laughs> um, you got a dream airplane? A dream airplane? Um, hmm. I've just had to do my helicopter license, and so... Oh, um, that'd be good. Yeah, so would, would my, I, I, I just wanted to go solo in a helicopter. I didn't necessarily want to get my license. I just wanted to fly a chopper by myself. And, um, I've, I've gotten past the solo stage, and I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Um, 
How does so, it how does it go comparatively to a, to an aircraft? Goes straight up. Straight up. <laughs> That's a good um, answer. They're different. They're so different machines. They've, they've got different. They've got different utilities. So um, yeah, they're, they're, compared to an aircraft, they're slow. They can't carry much, but they can get in and out of spots. You can't take an aircraft. So they're, they're different machines. They really can't. It's hard to compare them. Huh. So far as with what I enjoy about, which is the, just the damn fun of flying, that you can't have more fun fully clothed than flying a helicopter. Yeah, it is just that enjoyable. Does, does it, anyway, so do, does that reflect back? Uh, do you do you have a love for cars as well? Or? No, I don't like cars. No. no, if it's going to go fast, stick wings on it. I hate spending money on cars. Yeah, fair enough. So yeah, because yeah, you just get to the next traffic light quicker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty well. And plus, I'm just I don't know. Yeah, it's a, to me, it's uh, no, I've just never liked cars that much. To be yeah. Honest, so yeah, yeah, I, I, I've got you know, I I can admire cars, but I'm not one who. You're not going to rush out and buy a Rolls Royce no, or anything like that. Talk about bloody like, V6s or eights and tappers and lifters and rollers and donks and I don't know. <laughs> Blowers and I don't know. whatever's going on. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> and so, so is there is there a dream helicopter on the on the horizon for you? Oh, a, a dream flying machine. Let me think. Uh, I, I'm I'm actually uh, I, I did a seaplane riding a couple of years ago, um, mm. and that was a lot of fun. So I've done the I think it was six and a half hours I had to do. I did I did six and a half hours, and that's all I've got. I haven't done it since. Yeah, but um, that'd be great for the fishing side of things because you yeah. essentially land it up and <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's an aircraft called a Grumman Mallard, which is a uh, high wing two engine, a World War Two. They only made 175 of these things. Oh, wow. There's an aircraft that crashed in the Perth River a couple of years ago, quite spectacularly, just before the fireworks on New Year's Eve. Yeah. You saw that. It was a Grumman yeah. Mallard. The guy just turned too sharp, too low. It was always going to happen. Yeah. Um, it was poor pilot. Well, you know, I shouldn't say that. It was very unfortunate. Two people died, but hmm. and I haven't seen the official investigation. For me, it looked like poor piloting. Hmm. Um, but they've actually re... I mean, these things are bulletproof. I mean, the Japs couldn't bring them down, if you know what I mean, with gunfire. So they're, they're, they're pretty solid machines. But yeah. they've actually taken the pistons off, put turbines on. They're called turbine mallards. They can, they can cross the world, you know, literally everywhere. They, every, you know, what is it? Three quarters of the Earth's surface is water. Yeah. So that's all landing field, right? Wow. And they're just this beautiful... It's like a like a uh, Winnebago in the sky with a couple of PT-6 turbines on either end and... I don't know. I, I buy all these toys and don't use them now, so I don't. I don't see myself going out and rushing out and buying a turbine mallard. There are two for sale, though. Um, so you've definitely looked. <laughs> so um, supreme machine, just absolutely supreme machines. Yeah, that can be part of the long term goal when everything uh, everything settles down and everything. Look, yeah, like, you know, there's always there's always room for toys. Um, but, you know, it's uh, you just got time to use them. Yeah, yeah. Well, Especially that- with aviation as well, right? If you don't actually fly them enough, you're actually dangerous to yourself. So there's no real legal requirements for minimum number of hours, but if you don't if you don't fly it off enough because it's just a familiarity thing, you're, mm. you're, you're you're a danger to yourself. So I, I probably fly, oh, I a third half of my time on aircraft with a with a we call a first officer, check and training pilot. It, rarely ever do they touch controls. It's just you know we go through stuff and it's, it's good to have a more experienced person sitting beside you, sort of. of you, know, you get up and you go, oh, "Why's it going there?" Put the wheels up, dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever sort of little thing you've forgotten. Um, not that's a little thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, if you want to be, I did 160 odd hours last year, which is a lot for an aircraft. So, I, I'm yeah. pretty good last year. But other than that, you know, I'll fly a lot of. I said, you know, around half, some, some side, either, somewhere either side of half of my time with an instructor. Yeah. So just because that, you know, I want to go home in the day. Officially, so, yeah. yeah. What age were you when you started flying? Uh, I was um, just flying to the US. So that would have been 2007. Oh, so quite recent so then. 2007. Yeah. And it was one of those um, love at first sight sort of things? No, oh, I wanted, wanted to do it for years, but I just never had the opportunity, I suppose. And you know, I had a bit of, bit of, bit of commercial success in our businesses, which was good, and, mm. and I had a few spare shekels. And uh, yeah, just you know, went and started doing some flying lessons. So, yeah. Yeah. And you buy, buy the aircraft you've got now shortly after? No, I've been, it's been a while to get to that aircraft. So I had a, initially had a. As I learned to fly when I was at Google in 0809. I, I, I got my license, finished my license over there. So I got a US license for an Australian license, um, and then uh, came back here and I bought like a, a four-seater um, piston engine Cessna 182, which are brilliant. I love the aircraft actually. They're just they're slow, they're 140 knots, but I mean they are um, very utility. You know, you can put the damn things down anywhere. Um, very, you know, they're, they're very light in the maintenance. Um, they're a lot of fun. Um, they're, like the, they're like the BMX of the uh, of the sky. Um, then I bought a, a turbine converter Cessna 210, which is six seat pressurised, and they replaced the piston engine with this little helicopter, little turbine helicopter engine, R, uh, R250 Rolls Royce engine. Um, and and that went, you know, that went like stonk and hell. That was mm. awesome. Um, but uh, then we had a family, and, and the pressurisation system was a bit junior. You got a lot of few ear pressure pressurisation issues until it stabilised, and there were kids in the aircraft. 
So we ended up buying the um, the Twin Commander, the yeah, the, uh, the the AC ninety, the, the six ninety Alpha, I should say. Yeah. Um, That's just the beautiful machine. Can't fault. Yeah, it's good. Well, you know, I hold, owned it for a week and it got hit by a thunder, hit by that bloody lightning storm about six years ago. No, oh, great. Five years ago, at, at a large field, it got, got t- touched up in a, in a pretty bad um, uh, uh, hail storm. So they got um, so it was out, down and out for about four or five months. So it had, it had issues getting it getting the cert, getting getting it in the air after that. <laughs> yeah. Some battle um, scars on it. Yeah, but you know, we ended up, we ended up sort of you know stripping the whole thing out and doing a lot of work on it and making yeah. making it sort of bulletproof and bit know, of a blessing in disguise though. So, so yeah, cool. oh, you know. Um, but yeah, she's a strong strong aircraft, really strong, strong, reliable. You know, we took all the light bulbs out of it and stuck LEDs in. So yeah, we have one. People don't realize you have one light blow on an aircraft, like an external light, like a navigation line, hmm. and it's 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 down. And then you haven't got to get a technician into legally can't fly. No. You, you could always say on it, it, it popped in flight, sir. I didn't notice it. But, yeah. um, <laughs> I'm sure the fines are a bit more strict than they were. Well, the, the, the rules are there for a reason too, right? Exactly. They're there to be safe. So, uh, and so, yeah, that can be like, you know, and these bulbs can only last like 60 hours or something and cost 2,000 bucks. Jesus. So you just replace it all with LEDs. So we you know, went through and just, okay, anything that's going to break on this thing, let's just replace it with a modern equivalent mm. and, and, and be done with it. So, because it's, what's worth more if you've actually got a few, no, I, I got stuck out with my two ten out of Birdsville Pub one time. We were flying out to um, Ayers Rock. And we got stranded there because a little little like a nineteen dollar um, uh, igniter for the turbine engines failed. You're kidding? So no, not at all. We had to get picked up the next day. We came back about, about ten days later after they fixed it. They flew a guy out with the part. He fixed it. We flew out ten days later to pick it up, which happened to be AFL Grand Final day. So we had the AFL Grand Final at the Birdsville Pub that year. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. That would have been a good experience. Yeah, it was good actually. Yeah. I actually flew my flew my one eight two. So we flew the one eight two out. I bought a trainee commercial pilot at me from from Archerfield, and he flew it back because he just wanted the hours. Yeah. And then we stayed the night. Um, no, he actually left the next day. We all we, we all stayed the night, watched the footy, uh, had a few beers at Birdsville Pub, and yeah. <laughs> got up the next morning and off we went. Off you went, yeah. So, yeah. Another blessing in disguise was the sounds of it. Bit of fun. Yeah, yeah. You have a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming no on, Steve. I, I thoroughly appreciate it. Is there any last uh, last words for anyone that's just starting out or aspiring entrepreneurs that you'd like to share at all? To start. Like start. You'll learn more by starting. Like yeah. gather, the, the, gather the skills and the expertise you need and, and try as best to get the best network as you can and then, and then muck in. Yeah, straight into it. Mm. All right, execution is everything. That's it. Thank you much, Steve. Okay, very much, Steve. I thoroughly appreciate it. Have a good day, much. Cheers. Thank you so much for tuning into the show today. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed it and uh, jump over to lessonsfromsuccess.com.au and make sure you jump on that email list so I can notify you as soon as any more shows come out. I'm your host, Bryn Turner, and thank you so much for joining us.